The Oracle Network. Look deeper. Welcome to Brew Crime. I'm Mike. And I'm Beck. And I'm Nina. All right. This episode, we are going to do Most Wanted. So that's Canadian Most Wanted, America's Most Wanted, whatever the heck it is. Most Wanted. So someone who's been on the Most Wanted list at some point, even if they've been caught since. So I'm going to start this episode, I hear. <laughs> yep. So, all right. I am going to start with my pairing, and then we'll get into the actual case. So mine is a, it's a collaboration between Strange Fellows Brewing in Vancouver and Crooked Stave Artisanal Beer Project from Denver, Colorado. But I actually don't know when this came out, so it might be a new beer that's been in barrels for a bunch of time. I'm not sure. This beer is called Thick as Thieves. It's a provisional wild saison. It's 9.1% alcohol, and it's in a huge 750 milliliter bottle. And it says, Best keep a sharp eye on your glass of this barrel-aged wild saison, lest it be prolonged when you're not looking. Brewed in a unique multiculture in cunning collaboration with our accomplices from Crooked Stave Brewery. This delicately sour saison with its sweet and spicy aroma and rounded body lemony character would be an enticing treasure for any backyard moonlighters. So I didn't even do it on purpose, but I got two wild saisons for this this sitting. Mm-hmm. This beer is kind of a cloudy orange. It's a bit of an off-white head that's fluffy on top. Got kind of a peppery spice note on the nose with hints of some fruit in the background. A little bit of funk. Ooh, geez. Big lemony pucker note on the first uh, sip. And then there's that peppery spice that you expect from a barrel-aged saison. Maybe a hint of wood. Definitely got some graininess in the background. But it's like it's like that puckery lemon. It's a big note in this beer. Ooh, it tastes really good. But yeah, it's like drinking lemon <laughs> juice almost. <laughs> I love it. Ooh. Strange Fellows is definitely one of my favorite breweries in Vancouver, and I've had Crooked Stave a couple times, and I've never been disappointed. They make a lot of really good wild beers, so it was a good pairing here. Ian Hill from Strange Fellows can do no wrong in my books, really, when it comes to beer. Let's get into my story. Chicago has always been a rough town for gangs, and it is no different in the 1980s. Chai West was a street gang that had ties to the Ukrainian mafia. Jack Daryl Farmer was a member of the gang and was a tough son of a bitch. Same. Jack Daryl, the Jew farmer, would become the vice president of the Chai West gang. His rise to power, though, would move him to the little mafia, Ukrainian mafia, and he would end up becoming the boss. Big surprise, the Mafia was dealing in drugs to make the gang money. In 1984, he would be arrested and would lose a court case on federal drug charges and would end up spending one year of a five-year sentence behind bars. But as you can guess, when drugs come into the picture, there are probably going to be a lot more crimes involved. It would not be long until he was back on the hot seat, and that would begin in 1987. He would be charged with murder, racketeering, conspiracy, extortion, burglary, extortion of justice, robbery, and narcotic trafficking for a total of 108 counts. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. Go big or go home, I guess. Exactly. He was not messing around with his branch of the Little Mafia. Before he could be picked up by the police, though, he and his wife would pick up and run. They would end up landing in Florida, in a town called Lantera. He would land a job in a storage place called Public Supermarket Warehouse. He had good reason to pick Southern Florida, though, as it had a large presence of Russian and Ukrainian mafia, and that would mean he would have some help in hiding from the police. Who knew? (laughs) Yeah. Jack Darrell Farmer would be in hiding for a total of 13 months in Southern Florida. Something happened, though, in 1988 to help break this case. On May 29th of that year, America's Most Wanted would air an episode where they covered Jack Farmer. The FBI would put him on their most wanted list the same day as the episode aired. 
Luckily for the FBI, someone was watching that episode on the night that it aired for the first time. That person happened to work at Public Supermarket Warehouse and recognized Jack right away, who had been working under an assumed name. That coworker would call the tip line right away, and the tip was passed on to the FBI. They knew it was credible, and they swooped in and had him in custody in three days after the episode aired on June 1st. Which is insane, because this is before the internet was really a thing and everything, so that is so fast. Yeah. The FBI would swoop in and capture the couple at 1 p.m. and their home on West Drew Street. There was a sign above the front door that said, God bless this house. And I would have to say that I don't think that his God did a very good job. His wife, Pamela, would also be arrested as she helped him escape the police in the first place. The neighborhood that they lived in was very shocked about their actual identity as they were wonderful neighbors. Their neighbors, Helen McKenzie and her husband, had even had them over to watch movies at their house. April 1986 would see Jack Darrell Farmer and his wife, Pamela, his brother, and 11 others indicted on 108 charges, including two separate counts of murder. I feel like the uh, that neighbor thing is the case so often, where yeah. they're just like, oh my gosh, but they were such good neighbors. And it's like, well, I mean, that's part of hiding. If you were an asshole, then it's much harder to hide. Mm-hmm. Jack was not one to give up easily, though. And while he had been in custody waiting for his trial since his arrest, he did not plan to go down without a fight. April 10th, 1987 would be a bad day for his and his wife's lawyer, as while preparing for the trial, in his custody, the pair would bind and gag the lawyer and would proceed to escape in 1987. Their own lawyer? Yeah, the the jail released them into his custody and they fucking bound and gagged him. I guess they had to do that, though, so he wouldn't be cited as an accomplice as well. Probably, yeah. This escape made him the FBI's number one public enemy. So, already been on the uh, most wanted list, but now he's number one public enemy. They would both be caught again, though, in June of 1988, and then put on trial. James Swartzer, a former prosecutor, described Mr. Farmer and his cohorts at the trial as one of the most vicious groups of people I have ever seen. Frank would be charged for a murder where he shot a man in the head at close range. He was also said to order murders of people as well as home invasions, all to fund his cocaine and overall drug operation. In the end, Jack Farmer would get a sentence of 40 years in prison. He would not be eligible for parole until he had served 23 years. Pamela would also be given a 20-year sentence. Luckily for many, Jack Farmer never had the chance to make parole out of Leavenworth Prison. In June of 1993, Jack would be found hung in his cell. But after an investigation federally, it was deduced that this was a suicide. Jack had been placed in an isolation cell as other inmates had claimed that he had stolen drugs from them. And they were after him. He died at age 41. So that's my story. Hmm. I mean, I think it's also important to add that Jeffrey Epstein did also not commit suicide. He did not hang himself. I'm actually surprised that, uh, what was her name again? Giselaine Maxwell? Yeah, I'm surprised she hasn't committed suicide in the future yet, because that's we'll coming. Uh, I'm going to talk about Richard Lawrence Marquette. I'm just going to call him Dick, because Richard, Dick, that's yeah. what uh, people Perfect. do. What a yeah. call. And, yeah, he was on the FBI's most wanted list. Before I get into his background and all of that, he's a bad guy. He killed three women. And I'm going to talk about my beer now. So, funnily enough, if that's a thing, uh, similar to my pairing for the last episode, to this episode, I picked another Driftwood Brewing beer. Wow, they are so popular today. They're just, yeah, I mean, if they continue with these bougie-ass fucking cans (laughs) that match our stories, they're amazing. So, this beer is called Goldiewell Full Coal. And the reason I picked it, um, it's a light beer, so I'm sure I'll love it. It's right up my alley. It's only 3% alcohol. And it's cool, orangey, yellow, tan, whatever. The reason I picked it is because the guy I'm going to talk about, Dick, was accused and uh, admitted to, so not like he didn't do it, 
killing three women, and there are three beautiful women on the can. Going to read what it says on the can. It says, we draw from the Goldie Well of fate. Human destiny is but a drink we've poured and tasted tenfold. And thankfully, they have also included the ingredients with pictures, in case you're dumbass like I am. <laughs> and the ingredients are, which I'm sure also talk to the taste, which I won't be able to do since my mic's not here, is there is water, barley malt, oat malt, hops, and yeast. Mm. What is the picture for water? What is the picture for water? A droplet. Oh. So it's very light. It's murky. And it looks like the color, if you don't drink enough water, what your pee looks like at the end of the day. Drink more water, Nina. My pee doesn't look like this. <laughs> Just kidding. I said what your pee could look like. Y'all hydrate. No, my pee's never yeah. looked like this. Are you kidding me? I'm perfectly hydrated. Anyways, um, and it has a very light head, if any, and it tastes hoppy, and I can also drink this one. Nice. That's yeah. awesome. That's multiple beers. Not, I don't like it as much as the previous beer, but this is a drinkable beer. If this came across a flight, if I ever go to Driftwood and this was served to me in a flight, I would not have to drink it as a shot to get it over with. So, mm. Where is Driftwood? I'm sorry. Victoria. Victoria. Thank you. From Beer Advocate again. Thank you, Beer Advocate. They say, it looks like it, they're saying aromas of peach, rhubarb, tart, and sour. Do you get that at all? That sounds amazing to me. Tart and sour, yeah. Mm. I don't know. I, I I can't tell you that I know what fucking rhubarb tastes like. Uh, I think I had it. I think I had it in a cake a couple of weeks ago. It's that red long thingy, right? Yes, yes, the yes. red long thingy. Yes. And then I it tastes rhubarb. of uh, peaches and green tea. Supposedly, it's got a light body with almost no carbonation. So that's what this person says on Beer Advocate. This person says interesting beer with uh, more like a hoppy pale ale with a low ABV so alcohol. But this is one that has lots of flavor. Le definitely a light beer, but a tasty one. Yeah, it's good. Whatever. Nice little summer drink, patio, chilling on a blanket kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's get into my story. So when it came to picking a story for Most Wanted, I think originally this was my idea to come up with this topic. Yeah. Uh, not that I want to take all the credit for it or anything, but I do. And I had an interesting time. So the story I did want to do is the one that Beck picked, but she did call it out first, and it is fully hers. So whatever. <laughs> um, my mom told me not to disrespect my seniors, so I respect your wishes. That's the case. <laughs> uh, Mike, that was directed at Beck because you didn't do the story. Anyways, no, but I'm, so yeah. I think who, I don't know who's older, but still, fuck you. <laughs> I'm the oldest, so that's it's okay, guys. I'm turning 30 this year, so watch oh. out. Yeah, cute. Just <laughs> I just turned 38. Fuck you. <laughs> How's that, old man? Yeah. Anyways, old. So, a couple of things with the most wanted thing. I originally picked a story, which was the first person to ever end up on the most wanted list, and then I was like, ooh, all eager and excited. And then I realized all he did was rob a bank, and I'm like. Pfft. Fuck that. I don't want to talk about bank robbers. Um, and then a couple of the other ones, I didn't like, they didn't tickle me. And I've been getting a bit worried because I feel like I'm getting so desensitized to like things that are going on that I was like, okay, cool. No, I need to find a murderer. So that's kind of fucked up. A little bit. But here, here we are today. Yeah, I don't know. It's kind of, kind of weird. So yeah, let's talk about Richard Lawrence Marquette. As I said earlier, obviously I'm going to refer to him as Dick. So he ended up on the FBI's most wanted list. Before we get into the crimes and the things that he did, I want to talk obviously a little bit about his background. Not that Dick had the most exciting or riveting background. Uh, born on December 12th in 1934 in Portland, Oregon. And right away his history just goes into his arrests because he is a piece of shit. Or is he a pecker? He's sticking with the theme. You're sticking with the theme, yeah. I'm sure he was in jail and he's thought about it long and hard. <laughs> but I'll get into the... Did he get the shaft? <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyways, let me get into this. This guy is a bad guy. We shouldn't be making this many jokes about it. Synonyms of dick. <laughs> no, we're making fun of him. He's yeah, so... Because he doesn't he, deserve respect. He doesn't. He doesn't deserve his pecker. Um, so, 
his first charge came around 1956, and it was an attempted rape charge. However, when it came to sentencing and actually going through proceedings, the alleged victim actually dropped the charges. Mm. Oh, no. Yeah, so that didn't actually uh, turn into anything. He was then arrested a couple months after for disorderly conduct. He attempted to rob a service station, so a gas station, with a sack full of wrenches as a weapon. Wow. Yeah, it's that's that's scary. scary. It's fucking terrifying. I don't know if y'all have seen, y'all have seen the movie Dodgeball, but if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. Uh, which I don't know that this guy committed the crimes when that movie came out, which obviously he didn't, but I wonder if some oh of that God. came from that because that is just some bullshit. That was a good movie. That was a great movie. The good guys. Anyways, no, what are they called? Not the good guys. Joe's, Joe's Gym, right? Something like that, yeah. It's something, know. yeah. Ben Stiller. No one makes me bleed my own blood. Yeah. Bit of a tool. Anyways, I love that movie. And at the, sorry, spoilers, but at the very end when he's all fat again and just looks like gold member, like, fuck, me, 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 me. It's great. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> highly recommended. We'll include a link at the podcast where you can go watch <laughs> Dodgeball. Anyways, back to the story. It's, okay, one sec. It's so funny that you're raving about that because we recently went through our DVDs. To fig- like, we need to get rid of some. It's insane. Uh, and it's in the pile of, we need to watch this and see if it's actually still good. Yes, so it is. if I decide that it's not, do you want it? I don't want to be friends with you if you decide it's not. <laughs> so I think that's, okay. you, could put it on, you could put it on the keep pile. Or put it on the um, mic pile. Okay, well, I don't I'm own sad it. Sad that our I'll take it. I'll so... take it. I'll take it. I'll okay. take it. Back to my story. So, yes, he attempted to rob this gas station in 1957 using a sack full of wrenches Mm -hmm. as weapons. And he ended up receiving an 18-month sentence in jail. However, he was released after 12 months for good behavior. Okay. Fucking good behavior. He didn't have access to wrenches in prison, so it was fine. He didn't play with his tool in jail. That dick. Um, You've always had a good handle on things. So, everything that I mentioned above has nothing to do why he ended up on the FBI's most wanted list. What he actually ended up doing later in life was unspeakable. He ended up being found guilty, charged, and did confess to the murders of three women. Their names were Joan Caudell, Betty Wilson, and a Jane Doe. And I'll touch base on each of the cases so, yeah, I wasn't too sure in what order to talk about the three cases or to talk about what point he actually ended up on the most wanted list. So I'm just going to talk about the women, uh, the victims. First victim, as I mentioned, was Joan Caudell. In 1961, her husband reported her missing. She failed to return home after shopping. And long story short, three days later, parts of her dismembered body were discovered and scattered over several different vacant lots in the southeast neighborhood of Portland. Later on, fingerprints identified the victim as Joan Codell. There was a couple of eyewitnesses that the woman, uh, Joan, was in a tavern on the night that she disappeared and that she was linked to Dick as spending some time with him and actually leaving with him. Dick was actually a regular at this bar, and both of them visited it many times, so for sure they had some type of interactions, anyways, as regulars at the tavern. One thing to go into, her husband reported her missing after not returning from shopping, but I was confused as to why she disappeared at night from the tavern. So I guess she went out shopping, then went out for drinks, and just never came home, which is a bit weird, but I don't think it's anything unusual. The day after her body was identified, charges were filed against Dick. And one day after the charges were filed, which would be now June 19th, he was named a federal fugitive on unlawful flight. And of course, on June 29th, in 1961, he ended up on the most wanted list. The day after he ended up on the most wanted list is the day he was caught. So actually the first fire that went out... And a manager at an employment agency in Santa Maria, California, recognized him immediately. 
It was a guy she had just talked to. And he was, of course, uh, located, picked up, and arrested. Now, what his story of events is, is that he was at the tavern with Joan, that, yes, uh, they left together. They argued after having sex, and he ended up strangling her. And in order to, and I'm going to quote him, facilitate disposal is why he dismembered her and scattered her body parts everywhere. Fuck. Yeah. On July 2nd, so June 29th, he went on to the thing, arrested the next day, July 7th. This is in a week, less than a week. He did take the local authority to the remaining parts of her body where he dumped him, which is pretty crazy. Yeah, So sure. obviously very guilty, really, really, really bad guy. But it gets worse because he's arrested. Remember I told you guys he had three victims. There's still two more women. He ended up being convicted of first-degree murder, and he received a sentence to term of life imprisonment. Now, one of the worst things here, after 12 years, he was paroled on good behavior. They let him out. I don't, wow. I don't understand that. The, sorry, he was... Life imprisonment. Was, yeah. And 12, after 12 years, good behavior, he was paroled. So he had to like do the check-ins, he had to be at the home, like all of that. But he fucking killed someone and dismembered them. After a exactly. robbery, like the first he did the robbing of the gas station, which mm -hmm. is one kind of strike. I don't want to say strike, but let's say strike. And then you go to this. Holy crap. Why the hell did he ever go out? Right. It's not like uh, this was something like uh, in the heat of passion and it happened. And then he called police or something like that you know he like holy shit i just her. strangled her he dismembered her he tried to hide the fact and he was caught and he served 12 years like that's a joke that's yeah, a no. fucking horrible joke yep he was described as a model prisoner which he literally admitted to murdering her and even talking about draining her blood and her body to make it easier to dispose and clean up of things. Like, this is yeah. premeditated murder to a fucking T. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't understand who thought this was a good idea. Let's jump forward to 1975. So this would be two years after he was paroled. Okay. Two fishermen discovered mutilated human flesh floating in, and I might say it wrong, in Shiloh Slow, it's the name of the uh, Lake River, in Marion County, Oregon. The body parts were presented in a similar fashion to what the original victim, Joan, who I talked about, later through recovering a lot of the different body parts, they were able to confirm that it was the body of Betty Wilson, who was originally from North Carolina, the focus fell on Betty Wilson's husband, which is common in cases where they look at the spouse first when there's suspicious circumstances of the disappearance and everything. Mm -hmm. However, it was very easy for the police to remove him as a suspect as he was actually at that time working on the other side of the country on a work contract. That's pretty so clear. He, it wasn't definitely not the husband. It took them only 55 hours to... Wow. I examined all the remains. I actually found some evidence, and I couldn't find what the evidence was, tying Dick to Betty. Of course, he was arrested again for murder. Similar to his first murder, he did plead guilty. He used the same story that he did when talking to Joan, is that they had sex, he strangled her, and dismembered her. While he was confessing to the murder of Betty Wilson... He actually also confessed to another woman he murdered the year before. So that means he was in 1973, released from prison. 1974, he picked up another woman at a bar, convinced her to go home. They had an argument after sex. I guess he, for this one, he said there was a disagreement among the amount of money that is owed for the service. I see. And he actually led the police to her corpse, which was a shallow grave. Now, I did refer to her as Jane Doe. That's because they don't know who she is. 
He wow. just picked her up that night. Nothing was left on her body, like a uh, wallet identifying items. So they actually do not know who she is, but they did recover an intact corpse. Yeah. So yeah, 93 released, 94 he murdered Jane Doe, and 95 he murdered Betty Wilson. So so three victims of Dick. I cannot believe that he was released after the first murder. Obviously he reoffended, and two more women lost their life to him. He, at this point, is incarcerated. Uh, he received two more life sentences with no eligibility for parole this time. Good. And he is actually still alive, and he's living in Oregon State Penitentiary. And that's where he'll remain until his last breath. Wow. Yeah, so he's in his like 80s, late 80s, still there. Obviously, he's this time not going to be paroled or anything, but I've never heard of this guy before. And then looking into the research and research and all of that, and that's bad. That is some bad justice system for letting him uh, be paroled, I guess, the first time. But I don't know all the circumstances around it, but holy shit. So, yeah, that's my story, guys. Wow. It's quite the story. I am going to start with my pairing today. Um, It is actually a cider, a foraged cider from Windfall Cider, and it's called Lost and Found. Where are they from? Sorry. That's okay. They are from Surrey. What? Yeah, they're in Surrey. Damn. Windfall Cider, Surrey, BC. And I've chosen their Lost and Found foraged cider in hopes just to put out some good energy that the criminal that I have chosen, who is on the FBI's Most Wanted, will be found. Yes, because he is still missing. So, does it say what's foraged in this cider here? I'm going to read it, and maybe that will tell us. My bad. That's okay. Uh, It's a 7% cider. It's dry, which is the best kind of cider. I don't like a sweet cider. And the bottle says... When something is lost and then found, that's a windfall made from apples foraged in the backyards and urban orchards of Vancouver and a now lost heritage orchard in the Fraser Valley. The seriously dry cider is full bodied with complex acidity and delicate earthy notes. Sounds Hmm. very nice and refreshing. So it is very clear, very clean looking, almost nothing on top here, which is not Strange for a cider, that's for sure. It smells very purely of apple. That makes sense to me. How is it? Not very effervescent. If I'm being honest, it has surprisingly little flavor. Oh, that's too bad. But it's refreshing. It's, def- it's tart, which is nice. I like tart for cider. I, don't- I just hate it when they're sweet, because then it's more cooler than cider. Yeah, I'm not sure what else to say. Mike, did you um, look up a re- or anything i can hear all right for this uh review i'll go into the it's a it's a beer review app basically called untapped and uh they also do ciders so this one says plenty of carbonation but it doesn't stay brilliantly clear hints of brett yeast on the nose exotic that's an older review though what they said about um there being the effervescence that doesn't stay, that's accurate because it did seem like excitable when I poured it, but then to taste, there wasn't really much there. It's funny here, oh. actually, on Untapped. Now, this doesn't mean anything, but all the reviews that I see for this cider are from August of last year. And there's one uh, random, uh, there's one rating from July of this year, but there's no writing at all. It's just a rating of 4.75 out of 5. So, I I don't know what to say because I'm not finding any actual words about this cider. So, you might as well go into the story. Yeah. Okay. I'm still glad I tried it. So yeah. I like to try new craft cider, so. Okay. I'm going to call this story Blaming, Blaming, Gone. A lifetime of It's Not My Fault Leads to a Cowardly Explosion. Robert William Fisher was born April 13, 1961, in Brooklyn, New York. 
he married Mary Cooper in 1987, and they lived with their two children, Brittany and Bobby, in Scottsdale, Arizona. To those that didn't know them, they appeared to have a lovely relationship. However, the neighbors heard them scream fighting more than once. Robert was a control freak, allowing only white paint in the house and not letting Mary hang her homemade quilts. I don't know if you guys have any idea how much work is involved in a homemade quilt, but it's a lot of work. Uh, just let her hang her quilts. Don't be such an ass. No shit, yeah. Like, especially if all the walls are white. Like, that's part of my worst nightmare. Like, <laughs> yeah, but obviously you. there's underlying issues to that, right? So, like... Of course. But to her credit, Mary wasn't one to back down. She decided to take a job, even though Robert wasn't a huge fan of this idea. So he felt that she should just be staying at home and raising their children. And that's how things worked. And she was like, "Uh, except that I want a job. So that's what I'm doing now. Thanks for coming out. It wasn't just his wife that Robert tried to control. Robert was an avid outdoorsman. And there's going to be a lot more than this shortly. He hated that his son didn't care for hunting and fishing. He taught his children how to swim by throwing them out of a boat. Fuck him. Yeah. He pulled them back in, but um, maybe traumatizing. Yeah, I think. That reminds me of my uncle when he tried to teach me how to go water skiing. And the, uh, the you know, teaching method was if you didn't get up, you didn't get to get back in the boat till you got up. And I said, fuck you. I unstrapped my water ski and I swam to shore. Yeah, uh, that's also how I learned how to ride a bike. My <laughs> babysitter in Germany, uh, her sister's kids put me on a bike and pushed me down a hill. I wow. fell and ate shit, brought me back up, pushed me down the hill on the bike again, and they're like, you could better learn to pedal. And I did on the second time, so actually I think it was effective. <laughs> yeah, I feel like this was a method that was more common than we were kids. You wouldn't, this yeah. shit would not fly now. No, fuck but no. it's like, okay, let's say they learn how to swim. Great. They learn how to swim, but they never want to go swimming again because you ruined it. Traumatized. Them. Yeah. Yeah. So Robert was an, an outdoorsman for most of his life, but at some point friends noticed that he started to exhibit some very strange behaviors. In one instance, after killing an elk, he walked up to the elk and then smeared the blood all over his face. Ooh, that's weird. Uh, my family hunts, like, uh, maybe less so now, but when I was a kid, my mom's side of the family, they hunt. That's not normal. Like, I've got some family and in-laws that hunt, too. It's definitely not normal. No. Yeah, so it gets worse. On a separate occasion, he snuck up behind a family that was enjoying a lovely picnic and shot his gun into the air until it was empty, just to see their reaction, just to, like, fuck with them. Fucking yeehaw Americana. But that that's not normal. No! That's not hunting. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with him? Yeah. <laughs> Lots. A lot, Yeah. Robert and Mary were members of the Scottsdale Baptist Church. In 1998, they sought marital counseling from the church's senior pastor. You'd think the counseling would be for Robert's general douchiness, but it was actually because he cheated on Mary with a sex worker Ah. at a massage parlor and got an infection from it and didn't tell her. That's douchey. So he's just a winner, you know, all around. So Robert had been part of the men's ministry at the church, but started to withdraw from the church's activities in like early 2001. Robert's mother never stood up to her domineering husband until she finally just left him. Uh, She saw her son following in his father's footsteps and spoke to Mary about her concerns. I'm sure it would have been horribly awkward and difficult, but it's a pity that she didn't talk to her son about being an insufferable shithead. (laughs) It's great that she warned her daughter-in-law, but maybe she should have talked to her son directly and just been like, stop being so controlling. Yeah. 
You're the worst. This is not a partnership, you know. By the end of March 2001, Mary had mentioned to several friends that she had had enough and was going to divorce Robert. Possibly this is what they thought about the evening of April 9, 2001, as later reported by neighbors. On the following morning at 8.42 a.m., a huge explosion shook the neighborhood. There were multiple smaller explosions afterwards, either from like stored ammunition or paint buckets. They're not sure what caused the smaller explosions later. It was initially reported as a natural gas explosion, but when the 20-foot flames were finally put out, it was clear this was no accident. The furnace's gas line had been forcibly removed. A lit candle had been placed on the floor as the ignition. It would only ignite when the room was filled with the gas, though, as the gas would fill the room from the top to the bottom and the candle was sitting on the floor. So this would have taken about 10 hours or so. This was clear arson, and the investigators were in for much worse discoveries as they continued through the house. The burned bodies of a woman and two children were found lying in bed. Mm. Mary, 38, had been shot in the back of the head. Brittany and Bobby's throats had been cut from ear to ear. They were 12 and 10, respectively. So where was Robert? At 10.43 p.m., the night before the explosion, he was spotted at an ATM. He took out $280, and you could see Mary's vehicle in the background of the security camera. On April 20th, the last physical evidence of Robert was found. It was his poop. (laughs) (laughs) It was his poop. Police found Mary's vehicle 100 miles north of Scottsdale in Tonto National Forest with the family dog still inside. Robert had pooped right beside the passenger door and then just disappeared. This location wasn't selected at random. It was an area that Robert knew well. There were dozens of nearby caves for him to hide in and... Maybe he hid and then escaped. Maybe he hid and accidentally died. Maybe he hid and then died by suicide. But July, a warrant was issued for his arrest. Three counts of first-degree murder, one count of arson. He was soon declared a fugitive, and on June 29, 2002, he was added to the FBI's 10 most wanted list. There is a $100,000 reward for information leading to his capture. There have been over 300 sightings of Robert since 2001. Most notably, at least to me, was a sighting that took place in February of 2004. This sighting even led to an arrest. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police arrested a Canadian man listed in articles as a Vancouverite from his home near the Canadian-U.S. border. I think he must have lived in like White Rock or something because Vancouver isn't really that close to the border. But you know how they just say, you're from Vancouver, because you're from anywhere near that. Right. So this unnamed man bore a striking resemblance to Robert Fisher. He had the same height, same weight, same eye color. He even had the same scar in his back and was missing the tooth that Robert had a noticeable gold crown on. So one of the like distinguishable factors about Robert's appearance was that he had a large gold crown on one of his tooth. And this guy was happened to be missing that tooth. That's weird. I mean, obviously the thought was that it was Robert and then he pulled the tooth so that he wouldn't be able to be distinguished. As recognizable. Yeah. Right. But what they didn't share was fingerprints. It wasn't him, and he was released, and his name was kept out of public record, obviously. Which is he hasn't good. done anything wrong. On the 15th anniversary of the murders, the FBI displayed aged-enhanced photos of Robert in hopes of getting some new leads. You can submit a tip to the local office. The closest one to us is in Seattle. Alternately, submit the information online, obviously, because that's easier. When I was doing my research, I was overwhelmed with the amount of time spent talking about what a large impact his parents' divorce had on Robert. They got divorced in 1976 when Robert was 15, and he always blamed his mother for leaving, even though his father was a control freak that was verbally abusive at the very least. Sounds a lot like Robert, if you ask me. 
I can understand that it was a rough divorce and that can be really hard on children, but him holding on to it throughout adulthood and using it as an excuse to murder his whole family is bullshit, to say the least. It's insane, right? Like, and I think the fact that he's never been located leaves us to all of these questions. You know, we've talked about it in previous episodes, like divorce is an option. Yeah. That is an option. And what these people are resorting to, I just, I don't quite understand. Yeah. There's a really great documentary on shit. I think it was Amazon prime called where is Robert Fisher? Mm -hmm. And it is good. And it goes through so much. The more stuff I look through, like I think probably where his poop was found and the fact that he brought the family dog and the dog was okay, leads me to believe that like he probably uh, ended his life. But then some of the reports are also like that he's such a proud man. Why didn't he just kill himself and let his family live? Exactly. It doesn't make sense. Like if he was going to do that anyway, then I'm absolutely not saying that that is a good decision to make. Yeah, I don't even know what to say. I'm not saying that that is the right decision to make. But if that's what you're going to do anyway, why, why would you kill your wife and children? Yeah. Like just leave. Just part ways. If you're not happy, just go start a new life and figure out what's going to make you happy. Because what he did end up doing is just destroyed so many people. Mm -hmm. You know, he was slash is pathetic, controlling garbage. You know, he couldn't let his marriage and wouldn't stop being a wretched bully to save the marriage. You know, it's like, I tried nothing and it didn't work. So I'm going to kill all of you. What the fuck? It was his fault completely. Like, just grow up. It's still, he's still on the FBI Most Wanted saying the $100,000 reward stands for information to his arrest. But I, I think like you, Nina, I lean more towards that he's died by suicide already than that he's still on the run. But the aged enhanced photos will be provided uh, on the website. You can find us on the website at brewcrime.com. You can find us on any social media platform at brewcrime. You can find us on your favorite podcast app. Just look up brewcrime podcast. If you want to buy some of our merch, go to brewcrime.threadless.com. We have shirts. We got masks now. We've got all kinds of stuff. You can get like tote bags, whatever you want. If you want our logo on a shower curtain, you can do it. And if you want to support us, go to patreon.com slash brew crime. You get our episodes ad free. And if you support us at a certain level, you get one episode a month extra uh, that no one else gets. You can uh, be like some of our supporters, like True Crime Nana, Daniela, Ange, Nina's Mom, Three Beers In Podcast, Amber, and the Faves of Our Live Podcast. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Brew Crime's intro was created by Mike using Creative Commons Attribution Licensed Audio from purple-planet.com, soundbible.com, and freesoundeffects.com. Logo design was by Ben Greenberg. All cases and stories were written by Beck, Nina, and Mike, and our sources are put into the show notes for each episode. We always want to give credit to the people that research the cases we talk about. Check out our store at brewcrime.threadless.com where you can purchase swag like t-shirts, phone cases, beach towels, and all kinds of cool stuff. We can also be found on your favorite podcast apps, our hosts, Spreaker.com or BrewCrime.com, as well as at BrewCrime on Twitter, at BrewCrime on Facebook, at Facebook.com slash groups slash BrewCrime. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Pacific Beer Chat. Murder Under the Midnight Sun is an Alaskan true crime podcast that shows you the darker side of the last frontier. From multiple serial killers to mass murderers and everything in between, my state has seen it all. Not only do we have the highest percentage per capita of serial murders, we also have a huge number of unsolved missing persons cases. With over 600,000 square miles made up mostly of wilderness, it's very easy to disappear and never be seen again. I'm here to tell those stories especially the stories of the victims, many of whom are often vulnerable members of society and their stories deserve to be told. 
So if you want to hear about bizarre and horrifying cases that you won't hear anywhere else, check out Murder Under the Midnight Sun, wherever fine podcasts are sold. We have an active shooter. We have an active shooter inside the warehouse. Welcome to Active Shooter, a podcast that covers the whys, the hows, and the aftermath of active shooter events. We will delve into the lives interrupted by domestic terrorists. We will investigate the background of the shooter and together discuss ways in which they can be stopped or even prevented in the future. We will also discuss the failures of our mental health system. They have an active shooter in the building. A second call says they uh, are being attacked. I've been shot. One six nine ten means we got shots fired. Four fifteen a.m. Route two ninety one sounded like an automatic firearm. But appears to be shots fired. We will look at the media responses and discover together how they may have inadvertently inspired and contributed to the rise of the mass shootings. Active shooter. Reports of an active shooter. Active shooter. Active shooter of mass casualty incidents. This is not a political podcast nor a podcast about gun control. This is a podcast that studies the psychology behind active shooters and how and why they make the decisions they have made to take the lives of innocent people. I love you. I love you. It's going to be fine. Can you hide somewhere? Can you play dead? Welcome to Active Shooter. Thank you for listening. Getting some weird little uh, feedback there. Yeah. Was that why you put your uh, headphones on, Nina? What's going on? Uh, yeah, you sounded like shit on my side, so I'm not sure if that was just me. I was Can getting some talk? weird, like, weird stuff. Yeah, it's I gone just now, heard a though. really quiet buzz when you were talking. It's gone now. That sounds better with the headphones on. Sorry. Crinkle, crinkle, crinkle. What are you doing, Nina? <laughs> I thought if I pressed it, I could mute it so that I can put popcorn in my face. No, uh, we've we've confirmed that did not work. Yeah, so my bad. <laughs> Just use the screen, though. I know, but I have to lift it because my nails are too long and I can't hit the button with how it sits in the case. So I have to go like this <laughs> to move it up, so I, I can click here. <laughs> oh, shoot, where was I? Shit. Sorry, buddy. No, no, no. I accidentally scrolled and now I don't know which way I was. I'm just going to sit back and get my beers ready because I've got two. My my in-between drink is still, like, full. Okay, do you want me to go next? Sure, if you don't mind. Okay, BRB. Good? Yeah. I'm good. Let me get this popcorn out of my teeth. (laughs) Beck, you're not going to say anything? (laughs) Well, it's uh, disappeared. My screen closed. Oh, no. Sorry. There. Oh. there. Oh. Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, that's my case. <laughs> I claimed first. Forever Which ago. you did, and, and I'm just fucking with you guys. I just Googled that quickly. It's not the case I'm doing. <laughs> I just thought it'd be funny. <laughs> no, I thought it was, but I, clo- I closed my computer. Oh, so Jesus you know. Christ. Oh, so saving that. You guys. I, did, I, did, I didn't screw this up again. Uh, no. <laughs> I didn't want to say... Hey, that's my case until I checked, but then my computer closed. So. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, no, I'm just kidding. Not going to have a repeat of uh, two episodes ago where I hijacked Mike's case. Um, so we're good. We draw from, why is this, I'm struggling with words. Okay. I know, it's pretty high tech stuff. Oh, Mike is showing us that that's what they did on his can as well. Mike is showing us his can. <laughs> He's got some nice cans. Oh, what's just a, kidding. Drift, would, what's this beer called again? Lots sorry. Of nice cans. Goldie Well Focal. As I mentioned, I am not doing the same one that Beck is doing. I just oh, thought it'd be funny. Nina, you're, you're cutting out um, all the stuff. Originally, when I thought of like the whole most wanted. 
Yeah, you just kind of started is that better? going like this. It, it, it seems was to just a connection issue. It wasn't like the microphone issue. Yeah. Okay. Is that back. better? Yeah. Yeah, you're better again. But yeah, it just kind of started going all of a sudden. Uh, that was actually the remix. Thank you. Um, <laughs> wicka, 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 wicka. <laughs> wicka, wicka. Get some boots, get some boots. No. Um, anyways, let's just pretend none of that happened. Um, obviously, he was. No. That's, a, that's I don't I don't say that word. I'm going to call him by his name. Dick. Um, so, wow, that beer is really gassy. Excuse me. Of course, he was arrested again. He Whoa. again. <laughs> Sorry. Whoa. We, what? We fully heard you like breathe into the mic. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry, dear. It was very loud. What's next? What, what was the last part you guys heard? Literally and... just that w- last word, and then you breathed out, and it was really loud. <laughs> okay. Feel free to cut up this dead air. Cheap bottle opener. <laughs> Fuck, I'll open that bottle for you. That's the bottle opener. Here's the bottle opener for you. No. <laughs> That's a machete. It is. If you've ever listened to Behind the Bastards in the more recent episodes, he has what he calls machetison. So we could practice some machetison. <laughs> Make sure to rinse this out first. Give me one sec, okay? All right. I don't okay. want the IPA flavors on a cider. It's um, not ideal. I'll practice machetison. So I'm calling this story Blaming, Blaming, Gone. A lifetime of It's Not My Fault led leads. I'm going to read that again. (laughs) (laughs) I missed one letter and it made all the difference. But it it wasn't just. Sorry, my voice sounds funny. (laughs) Sorry, I thought Nina was going to say something because she was unmuting one sec. No, I just finished chewing popcorn. Kind of reminds me a little bit about That's one it. of the... Uh, oh. You're muted, Mike. I don't know why I was. 